This episode of the Modern Therapist Survival Guide is brought to you by Green Oak Accounting. If you love dreaming about growing your practice, but you feel a disconnect between where you are now and where you want to be, check out Green Oak Accounting. The team at Green Oak Accounting can translate your action plan into your profit and loss statement. If you're behind on your books, ready to implement profit first, or need someone on your financial team who really understands private practice and can help your business grow, schedule a free consultation by going to greenoakaccounting.com. Listen at the end of the episode for more information. You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. This is where we talk about all things therapist, what you do with your practice, what you do outside of your practice, how your practice affects you. And today we are diving into a discussion that is no laughing matter, depression and burnout. (laughs) If it's no laughing matter, why am I laughing? (laughs) So, So we were sparked onto this conversation. We stumbled across this blog article from a psychiatrist who calls himself the fugitive psychiatrist. I'm assuming that this is a male. I'm maybe making that mistake of assuming somebody's gender, but we don't know who the author is other than fugitive psychiatrist. And the blog that really sparked our interest is called Why Don't Doctors Get Depressed? And the main basis or the points that are brought up is this psychiatrist thinks that we need two separate diagnoses because as mental health professionals, as professionals in general, when we consider all of the different groups of people who are studied around burnout, this includes teachers, first responders, we all think that we're special and we can't get into that you know, dirty world of having a mental illness called depression and that in order to soften our own identities, we need to have two separate distinctive diagnoses that there's the mental illness that is depression. And then there's the very honorable, I have burnout. (laughs) Very honorable. I like that. So you're saying that the stigma or the specialness of the people in the helping professions that oftentimes get burned out are not allowing themselves to be depressed because that would be awful. Instead, they've got a special diagnosis that accounts for all the same symptoms, but it's noble. And this is really where we've talked about self-care. We've talked about burnout. We've talked about compassion, fatigue, vicarious trauma, all of these different things that have a bunch of very similar features to them. And Maybe even going against some of our previous words, this might be an opportunity for us to explore where we actually stand on, are these two separate things, or is it just the same thing with two separate names? And I know that you have talked a lot throughout your career about sacrificial helping syndrome and looked at burnouts in some of these categories in in different ways. I dove into quite a bit of research in preparing for this episode and found that there really is two distinct schools of thought when it comes to our burnout and depression, the same thing. Obviously, one is that they are, and the other group says that, no, they're they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand just kind of at first response? That's a good question. I think, to me... I have worked in community mental health off and on for a lot of my career. I'm currently not doing that, but I, I had, and I also in my current practice, I take insurance still for a portion of my practice. And so I've always had to diagnose in order to be able to bill Medi-Cal, Medicaid insurance. And so to me, I respect and understand the purpose of diagnosis. So I'm, I'm framing it that way. But I think when you're talking about two different things or, or the same thing with two different labels or whatever, part of my response, so this was a very roundabout way of getting to it, but part of my response is that we label things in the way that it's going to feel helpful to us. I, I see diagnosis not as a real thing, but as a function of trying to 
choose a treatment strategy or to get paid by insurance because you've identified the the swath of symptoms that are coming together. I think sometimes diagnosis can be relieving because it's such a, you know, it's it's common enough that there is a name for what's happening to you. So to me, my first response is, well, duh, they're the same thing. They just maybe have different reasons or they look a little bit different because of where it's coming from. It feels similar. I know I've dealt with both. And so they it feels similar. I think it's it's something where to me, the labeling of it, I think, supports the treatment of it. And burnout, and obviously there's caregiver burnout. There's a lot of other burnout besides just work-related burnout. But I think with burnout, oftentimes having, happening in a work situation, and, and that's kind of traditionally where it's described, when that burnout is described in that way, there are specific strategies that seem effective in dealing with that kind of burnout or you know prevention response, that kind of stuff. I think with depression, there's a lot of different things. And so that that diagnosis is actually less helpful, but also you're not necessarily looking at specific situations. I think maybe, maybe you know, I'm, I'm talking out, I'm thinking out loud, but I think maybe it's more, I feel like burnout is a subset of depression and it's a specific type of depression is kind of where I'm coming from. And the labels are only helpful in that it just defines how you would treat it. And the World Health Organization would agree with your last point, that they find it to be a separate category worthy of its own description. And this is where sometimes I find when I have kind of reactions to things going on in the field that I look at, where does my opinion fall against other people who have been studying these things and researching them and working with people who have these symptomologies. And I get to a point where I'm like, okay, if the World Health Organization has classified these as two separate distinctions, I'm evaluating why my opinion goes against that. Because Mm -hmm. there does seem to be all of these common features that go along with both cases. It's you know, a lack of enjoyment in your own activities. It's disruptions in sleep and eating, less work output. All of these things sound like a major depressive episode or an ongoing depressive episode. The treatment strategies are the same. Take some time, exercise, get better sleep, get better health, go socialize with some people outside of your work, feel some personal accomplishment sort of things. Same treatments, same symptoms. Why not I do disagree. the same thing? You disagree. Okay. I disagree that they're the same treatments. I think as you were talking, and I think the way that I'm I'm refining my opinion on this, but I think depression is a big umbrella. And under depression, there are possibilities. There are things that are connected, but don't have to lead to the same things. There's burnout, there's grief, there's trauma. There's a lot of things that theoretically could flow in and also cause depression. But I think they do each have unique things. I think the difference about how you would treat burnout is it's fairly situation specific. You can do the whole life changes for burnout that you would do for depression. And I think burnout can cause depression and and can sometimes be the same as depression. But if we're looking at kind of just a run of the mill burnout, which up to almost, you know, the most recent Gallup poll says about almost 70% of people at least feel burned out at work sometimes. The difference with that is that if you completely change your work setting, that can lift almost immediately. Whereas I don't feel like that is the case for run-of-the-mill depression that doesn't have a specific cause. Obviously, there's a lot of different reasons we can be depressed. (laughs) Depression can be caused by a lot of different things. But just changing your work setting to something that's more satisfying that you feel like you have more control over, but that you don't have so many decisions you don't know what to do about, like you can actually lift burnout pretty quickly. And so I think it's something where to me, I do see it as burnout can be a subset of depression. It does have some different treatment. Some of it's the same, but I think it's something where I don't, I don't agree that it's exactly the same because I think that there are there is such a specific cause. And if there's not other depressive symptoms, if you've not laid on top of the work burnout, also 
kind of messing up your relationship at home because you're not engaging in your relationship and not, you know, kind of losing all the other areas of your life. If you've not laid that on top of work burnout, simple work burnout can be changed and can be addressed pretty quickly with changing your work setting. That's kind of a pretty elitist sort of view that you can just go change your work and have <laughs> an opportunity. So this this goes into that idea of what research by, and we'll include links to it, a lot of stuff. I think we're going to end up referencing quite a few things here in this episode. You can find our show notes at mtsgpodcast.com. This elitism that I'm I'm poking fun at you with here yes. goes to this idea in an article by I'm hoping that I'm gonna be pronouncing any of these names correctly, but Brennan Meyer Yupirin and Bunk. And this is a article in Personality and Individual Differences. The article is Burnout and Depression are not identical twins. Is decline of superiority a distinguishing feature? And so this idea of superiority that they describe is supporting your argument that there is a difference and a causal depression of burnout, that it is work-related, that affects all of these other areas of life that make it look like depression, but depression may be caused by other areas of dissatisfaction that has a impact on work life. So the the cause is where they, and I'm picking up from you, are defining where the starting point is. But this idea of superiority that they describe in this article is that they argue that humans have this innate need to categorize themselves within a social and organizational hierarchy. And that those people who have higher levels of superiority are less prone to burnout and less prone to having subsequent major depressive episodes. And what this superiority comes down to is their feelings of personal accomplishment, especially in comparison to those people around them in their social settings. So in other words, if we feel that we're better than other people, we probably feel better about ourselves. (laughs) <laughs> which goes back to the fugitive psychiatrist's argument that, yeah, this is just kind of this narcissistic argument of if I feel that I'm doing well and I'm having some sort of comparison point against people who aren't doing well, then that means that I'm special and I only have burnout and not depression. I think you're simplifying that up quite a bit uh, because it's saying that people who feel superior don't get to get burned out. I think for me in, in kind of, talking about both of these things in tandem, I think that people who feel like they have mastered and are doing better than the average on their work, they've mastered their job, they've got it going. And even though potentially they're feeling overwhelmed or there's things that are out of their control or whatever, that would prevent or or at least mitigate some of the the causes and and stuff for burnout, right? Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. And I think people who feel more confident and who feel like they're, they've are they got things, I mean, that's a frame, right? That's a positive frame. I can do this. It's a, a, a positive way of looking at the world. A, I, I have what I need. I can do this. And that's going to also mitigate against oppression. When you're talking about the elitist thing around, you know, well, people can just change their work setting and stuff like that. I think that there are that's potentially a whole other conversation. We've talked a lot about this in like toxic work environments and, you know, different episodes that we talk about work. But to me, what I'm saying that simple burnout is, you know, kind of uncomplicated burnout. If I'm going to start, you know, labeling things, uncomplicated burnout is truly about work and does not relate to other things. It is something where changing your job can change your your burnout. Now, if you cannot change your job because of financial situations or other things, it's not uncomplicated. It's not. And so to me, I'm I'm talking about diagnosis and not superiority. I just wanted to clarify because I got a little (laughs) triggered. I'm like, I'm not trying to be superior. I'm trying to say, 
for folks who have financial stability and the rest of their life is looking pretty good and they get burnt out at work, you know, kind of that simple burnout, they do have a lot of freedom of movement. Everything else is aligned. And that burnout is different than depression. When things get very complicated, whether it's complicated burnout or depression or, or com- complex PTSD, like when things are layered on top of each other, it's going to, to obviously be beyond simple burnout and go into, I think, depression. So I'm, I'm more agreeing with you than disagreeing with you as far as what we as clinicians experience. Because if we look at our, our experience of being clinicians, many of us, especially early in our careers, do not have freedom of movement because of you know, requirements or financial constraints. The work wherever we go is going to have some of those elements of vicarious trauma and potentially compassion fatigue. And there's also all of the reasons that we become therapists, which is oftentimes our own trauma or our own life experiences. And so we're much more wrapped up in the work than potentially someone doing something else. Not necessarily. So I don't know. And and so this is we kind of circling back to your thing. I don't know if burnout for helping professionals, and we'll talk about therapists since that's what our podcast is about. I don't know if it can actually be simple burnout. And it may, in fact, just be depression that we're being fancy about. So so I, 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 I think that we're a little bit more in alignment than you are presenting, but I do believe that there is something different. I do believe that there are separate, quote unquote, diagnoses. I just think that burnout itself, the word is being overused. Right. And I think that this is where there's a couple of of things. And one of your points, we're going to come back to later in the episode here. But when we were presenting at the Foundations of Connection conference in Kauai last month, we had asked the audience who here has experienced burnout and everybody in our audience raised their hand. And I followed that up immediately with who here has experienced depression. And once again, everybody raised their hand. Yep. And so th- this is an audience of mental health professionals. And I was kind of surprised that everybody was willingly being like, yeah, I've had depression. Yes. That whether this is a chicken or an egg sort of situation, or if one is a broader definition and one is more of a specific definition, then we start to look at kind of the ways that this plays out. And I think if we are talking about burnout and historical burnout, we do have to talk about Maslach's burnout inventory as being kind of the most widely used burnout measurement tool. And this was developed in the the early 80s, really came to popularity in a lot of research in the late 20th century and has been kind of serving as the gold standard for the last several decades. However, there are other burnout inventories that for whatever reason continue to be churned out by researchers and some are even down to a simple one question that are basically, are you burned out? And (laughs) But what this does is this muddies the waters of research on burnout, because yeah. if there's not great correlation between the definitions that come out of each of these, then it starts to really separate out the interpretations of who's burnt out and why. But going through all of these research articles, everybody keeps referencing this 1974 article by Herbert Freudenberger. <laughs> Freudenberger, I love that name. All right. So this article is in the Journal of Social Issues, came out in 1974, and it's titled Staff Burnout. And coming back to the point that you brought up earlier is despite being a peer-reviewed journal, I don't know that this article would really hold up to the standards of peer review today. <laughs> it it really reads a lot more like a blog. But okay. it it does come from a from a good place. Now, to to give you our listeners kind of where I'm coming from, in the second paragraph of 
this article. It starts with, the dictionary defines the verb burnout as to fail, wear out, or become exhausted by making excessive demands on energy, strength, or resources. Now, oh dear! <laughs> I don't think in 21st century journal articles that we can just get away with the dictionary, that we, we at least need to be specific enough to which dictionary. That the academic reference of the dictionary is not peer reviewed necessarily by other mental health professionals. Yes. <laughs> what I'm really doing is I'm calling into question that this is an opinion piece. It's an observational piece. I don't even necessarily think that it fits into qualitative research. Yeah. But, but this is held up as the foundational piece that all burnout is measured by. Oh, dear. And so this becomes problematic. And this, I, I did not do an exhaustive look at all of the responses to this Freudenberger article. But nobody questions, why isn't he asking about depression in this article? Why is he not separating out burnout from depression? Now, the overall point of this article is coming from his observations of free clinics by mental health professionals and the overall feelings that people have in response to doing this kind of free work over and over. And it's a very well-intended article and it's got some good structural suggestions that are included in there. And I'll come back to that point here in a little bit. But even within this article, Freudenberger makes the observation about what people with his definition of burnout is. And one sentence says, the person looks, acts, and seems depressed. <laughs> so he's not even following through on this own, why is there a need to be separate? And to me, this does mm. come back to that difference of superiority of, we need to have reasons to not be depressed. I mean, that depression is not for us, we're, we're the providers. But even in good research, this is not getting to that point of, yeah, these are two separate things. He's even saying, this looks exactly like this thing that we're treating. Yeah. Yeah. The things that I've been thinking about as you've been talking is that there are there are a lot of things that that I think could go into this wanting to make a distinction where one may not be there. So looking and acting as though one is depressed. There's especially in the 70s, there's there's a lot of things that weren't uncovered or researched yet. So this is more, a little bit more the Wild West, I think, as far as what people can publish, obviously, when they can just say the dictionary definition. I mean, that's not even a good blog post. <laughs> 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 but I think the pieces that I think have sustained it, so I don't know timeline, and I know that things have come in and out of, of vogue, so to speak. The first one is, Depression has been defined in kind of a medical model pretty clearly, which is, you know, kind of the, the serotonin stuff and there's, there's a lot of symptomatology and there's physiology and there's a lot of folks that will just automatically treat it with antidepressants, right? And you just solve the chemical imbalance and, and I think that understanding of depression, I think there's a lot of problems with it, but I think what we all know to be true that definition of depression doesn't really align with what we all as therapists know to be true, which is oftentimes depression is very situational. You know, that there are, it's, you know, I think there was a meme I saw one time. It was like, you're not depressed. You're just surrounded by jackasses or something like, I don't remember <laughs> exactly <laughs> what the meme was, but there's a lot of depression that's very situational and it's not a chemical imbalance that needs to be fixed, but it is life situations that need to be fixed, but there is a whole pharmaceutical industry that is very, very committed to depression being a thing. And, I, and I'm not saying that it's not, but that all depression can be treated by antidepressants because it is a chemical imbalance. And so, so to me, I think that there is that distinction that, that has to hold up because just having a crappy job that you're getting tired of doing can't be a reason that you get depressed. It has to be something physical, right? So that's one theory I have. I have another one. Do you want to respond to that one first, though? <laughs> well, I want to keep adding on about Freudenberger because <laughs> like all people who are able to monetize their blogs and turn it into other content, 
Freudenberger started writing books. Oh, good. Okay. And so probably the most famous book that he's written came out in the mid 1980s. And this uh, actually, it started in the early 1980s, 1981. Burnout, How to Beat the High Cost of Success. Ah. So (laughs) moving away from this medical model and at, at this time in psychotherapy's history, psychology's history, this is where there's this seminal decision of we're going to start really embracing this medical model. And so this mm. is kind of what I'm assuming is the the response that you're describing, which is if this is not a chemical imbalance, then we need a description for why we end up with the same feelings. Yes. But wait, there's more. <laughs> he follows this up with a book in 1986, co-written with Gail North, Women's Burnout for the Woman Who's Made Commitments to Everyone But Herself. Ooh, that sounds like my sacrificial helping syndrome. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm just seeing this progression of getting squeezed out of really refined academic descriptions and doing kind of the, the Dr. Phil, Dr. Oz move into pop psychology. And this has been one of the criticisms in early research and arguments around is depression different from burnout is is burnout just this pop psychology definition that has a different cause that we can have multi causes to get to depression it's yeah. not just a chemical feeling but does it still come to this well i don't want to admit that i'm depressed and that was my second theory and i i think that you've you've laid the groundwork perfectly thank you kurt my thought process the burnout the what was the title burnout how to beat the high cost of success or the, okay. high co- the high cost of high achievement. Oh, okay. So the burnout, the high cost of success or high achievement or whatever. I think when we look at that or women, you know, saying yes to everyone but themselves or whatever that was, or with helping professionals, burnout being doing the thing that you absolutely love and are meant to do in this world. If I were to admit that I'm depressed, which has a connotation of that I hate my life, then I'm going to have to admit that what I'm, I'm, I don't enjoy what I'm doing anymore, that I've lost, that it's lost its luster, that m- the, what I wanted for myself has actually created depression. And so to me, that's this other piece of, it's not even just like we need a special title. It's if I'm going to admit that I'm burnt out doing exactly what I meant to do and what I want, that's, even more painful. I mean, that's an existential crisis, it's right? So existential. That's immediately where my mind went. To <laughs> and, and this is influenced by the work that I do in my practice, which is mm-hmm. whether or not we're seeking out this happiness, it, it's getting to this place of recognizing that what we're doing is not creating it for those feelings of despair yeah. brings that existential question of does does this achievement that I'm trying to accomplish that very much goes with that definition of superiority Mm -hmm. makes it, is it all worth it? Which is a depressive idea. And it's one that one that many of us have to deal with because all of the structural things that come into our fields, all of the hoops that we have to jump through, all of the rationalities that we do for doing unpaid or underpaid work forces this question upon us much earlier than it might if we had picked any other field that (laughs) is actually supportive of itself. And probably why the early research focused on helping professionals first and subsequent research has gone out to teachers and other similar type professions. I would would argue that teachers are also helping professionals. (laughs) Not going to disagree with that at all. That what the point that I'm trying to make, though, is that it comes back to this feeling of personal accomplishment and being able to see any sort of progress. And why I think some of us who end up working in positions that we don't see progress, we work with populations where progress might be very, very slow or where clientele turn over very, very quickly. I'm thinking of 
people who work with kids on the autism spectrum, where progress might be months in between achieving yeah. different goals, or substance abuse centers where you see people at their worst, and 30 days later, they're replaced by somebody else who's at their worst. And it's just yeah. kind of this machine that gets perpetuated that does have its toll on on us as workers. Now, I do want to leave this episode with Freudenberger's suggestions, because I do think that they're actually good, even if they aren't based out of necessarily any sort of body of work before that. <laughs> Freudenberger would write a wonderful BuzzFeed article, had this been available in 1974, but he has the top 10 tips for preventative measures of preventing staff burnout. Part of that is sifting out people during the hiring process who would likely be those who burn out because burnout creates a kind of echo effect of burning out among other staff members. Sure. Number two, helping training staff judge and evaluate the difference between realistically dedicated people and unrealistically dedicated people looking at their goals. This is basically creating a workplace culture around identifying burnout and being able to have it not just be a top-down sort of structure, but a within the staff identifying and being able to help make changes before it becomes a problem and spreading across. And I think the other piece to that is also reasonable expectations and having the, that be a culture of working a reasonable amount of time versus a culture of working way, way too much. Number three, avoid sending the same staff member into a given job situation over and over. And this was a point that you were bringing up on your own without having seen this earlier in the episode. <laughs> Gold star for me. Yes. <laughs> number four, limit the number of hours a single person works for you. Suggests a solid nine-hour shift with a one-hour break midday. Okay. Pretty good suggestions here. Yeah. Uh, number five, if you're working in a collective, then a sensible approach may be to work for four weeks and take the fifth week off. Huh. Number six, it is important for a group working together to feel together as a group. In other words, having more staff time that is not necessarily just work-related, but staff development. Number seven, sharing your experiences with others and see that staff members share their experiences with others. Number eight, it can be very helpful to give someone time off to attend a workshop as long as it is a learning experience and not an emotional encounter experience. Oh, yeah. Number yeah, nine. that would be pretty draining. <laughs> <laughs> go out and, and sit in one of the, the, what is that, saunas or whatever, and yeah. come back, and then you got to get back to work, even though you're completely dehydrated and emotionally drained. <laughs> Number nine, have enough staff. Get more people to work in your environment to help lighten the load. Yep. And number 10 is having a good balance of physical exercise. As much as it sounds like I have been hating on Freudenberger, all of his suggestions are really, really good. Really good. I was thinking like that is basically the talk we did with for Ernesto last month. <laughs> the research shows. So he kind of, he was prescient. We would love to hear your thoughts on whether burnout and depression are the same or different. You can do that on any of our social media, or you can join our Facebook group, The Modern Therapist Group. Check out our website, mtsgpodcast.com. While you're there, you can check out the Therapy Reimagined 2020 conference. We have some really awesome people coming. I don't even know if they're listed on the website yet, but our keynote speakers, we are announcing them. Dr. Harry Aponte, we referenced him in, we actually did an episode around his work back in November of last year around person of the therapist training. We are also being joined from Australia by Dr. Daryl Chow. And we are super excited that we are getting such, such big movers and shakers in the therapy world to come and teach our audience. You can also join me on a pre-conference workshop. We're going to do six hours of law and ethics, knock out those requirements for you. Talking about irrational ethics, are therapists even allowed to be human? And until next time, I'm totally not burnt out <laughs> with totally not depressed Katie Bernoy. Thanks again to our generous sponsor, Green Oak Accounting. You went to school to become a therapist, not an accountant. 
your time is much better spent doing what you love, helping people and not crunching numbers. That's where Green Oak Accounting comes in. They specialize in increasing the profit of private practices, just like yours, so you can reclaim precious hours each week. If you are interested in freeing up your schedule for more clients or just to get some time back for yourself, go to greenoakaccounting.com to schedule a 100% free, no obligation consultation today or sign up for five days of profit boosting emails. Don't forget that's greenoakaccounting.com. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes.